This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 238, recorded on June 21st, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from North Central Florida, Rich Condit. Hi there, Vincent. How are you today? I'm well. We're not in the same room. No. It's, you know, this is less and less <laughs> frequent. We've been in the same room a lot lately. We have been. Our last episode, Edmonton. I can't believe that was just a week ago, right? Uh, no, 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 no. We Two did weeks. one since then. We did uh, uh, The Hutch. Sorry, I meant uh, Seattle. Yeah, the yeah Seattle was last week. Yeah. yeah, Seattle. Was that right? It's amazing. Wow. I think we, I, I well, guess we recorded a little more. Early weekend. in the week. Yeah, yes, early. It's like a week Tuesday. and a half, actually. Yeah. Still. Uh, and it is uh, actually not quite mostly cloudy. It's probably 80% cloud coverage and 86 degrees Fahrenheit here. Wow, nice. Just so you know. Also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, Vincent. Hi, Rich. And Hi. the temperature here is 29 Celsius, 84 Fahrenheit. And You're uh, partly cloudy. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Hey, you got the same. Uh, you mm -hmm. probably don't have the humidity we have. Oh, yeah, probably not. What was your percent humidity there? Oh, That's a different uh, page. <laughs> <laughs> I have this app that has it all on one. Oh, I don't have that app. Here it's 20, 27 degrees and 42% humidity, and the wind is from the south at 8 miles per hour. <laughs> it's going to be sunny the rest of the day. Little puffy clouds up there. It's a nice day. Yesterday uh, was nice, too, which was good because it was our son's graduation day. Oh, nice. And they have it outside so uh, everyone can fit on the football field. It's cool. Our humidity is 44%. Uh, it's close I'm, to ours. I bet his is 80%. I'm having trouble finding this. I have this app. Do you have an iPhone, Kathy? Yeah. I have an app called Weather. Okay. I think it's, it was. It's not weather.com, is it? No, it's just called Weather, and it's very nice. Really simple. It's about two bucks, I think, but. It's got a couple of. It's got three screens that you can flip around, and it's very cool. Check it out. Um, and that's it for today. Alan Dove isn't here. Uh, Dixon de Pommiers in France, and so we proceed. The three of us. Sixty-one percent. Sixty-one percent humidity. Yeah. So that's substantially higher. Yeah. Does it get higher than that down there? Well, you know, it depends on the time of day. You know, because it's relative humidity. So, yeah, it gets higher. I uh, felt it muggier. But you really, it's the, uh, if you want to get into it, it's the dew point is the critical factor. Uh, when you wake up in the morning and it's 75 degrees and the dew point is 75 degrees, you know you're in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> That's 100%. But as the day warms up, it, it really drops uh, dramatically. So, so 61 here, uh, is not as high as it gets, but it's... I just added Gainesville to my weather app. All right, there you go. Now 31 go. degrees centigrade. Uh, it says humidity 54% and zero miles per hour. Hmm, <laughs> you, have, hmm. you have no wind. Okay. I have on my uh, – so you can store locations and it automatically goes to them. I have here. I have Washington, my home city. I have Orlando. I, don't, I guess that was from Disney World. Edmonton and Gainesville. I didn't bother with Seattle because we were inside all the time. <laughs> Have you been, Kathy? I've been okay. I'm starting to learn about working in a BSL three facility. You gonna Ooh. you gonna do some work in there? Mm hmm Which virus is that? Oropuche virus. Oh, this is the guy in Brazil, right? Yep. Eureka Aruda. Cool. Mm -hmm. Very nice. What kind, of, what kind of a virus is Oropuche? It's a bunya virus. Uh, okay. And it's uh, transmitted by midges and causes a lot of uh, febrile illness in Brazil, second only to dengue. Huh. Or uh, arboviral diseases. Moving into RNA viruses. Mm -hmm. Wow. Scary. Back into RNA viruses. Scary. So you were with VSV with John Holland, right? Mm -hmm. See, I remember mm -hmm. your history. Mm -hmm. Huh. And I was with Phi X174 in Masaki Hayashi's lab before that, though. So I did start DNA. with DNA. Mm -hmm. 
DNA, RNA, DNA. The whole thing. RNA. Mm-hmm. Well, have fun in that BSL-3. Yeah. Yeah. We've already had an introduction to it and learned how to don and doff. Mm. Wow. Yeah. It's, uh, it's a step down from a BSL-4. Yeah. But still interesting. Mm-hmm. All right. Today we are doing a Virology 101. So no follow-up, even though, Kathy, the last episode we did, oh, uh, flu gets the VIP treatment. Right. A lot of follow-up. Okay. Huge discussions over on Facebook. Okay. Which we'll do next time. Good. Because I just want to focus on virology. But it's very interesting. All of it, like within an hour of posting the episode on Sunday, people wow. started talking about it. Flu rings the bell, I tell you. Yeah. So I, I was at graduation yesterday, and a, a friend came up to me, and she said, hey, is this MERS coronavirus going anywhere? <laughs> it's great. She called it well, the right name. Yeah. Front page in yesterday's New York Times. Yeah. And the day before was uh, HPV vaccine on the front page of the New York Times. Yep. Virology is in the news. Can't avoid it. Um. All right, let's do some Virology 101. The last one we did was about RNA processing. And now we're moving on to protein synthesis or translation, which is um, something I used to work a bit on. And as you will hear later, so did Rich Condit. Long time ago. A really long time ago. Many moons ago. Like 40 years? Like 40 years. Like uh, I would I would date my introduction to laboratory work on protein synthesis to about 1968. Wow. So that's even over 40 years. Like, is that, is that 45? And then I persisted in that discipline until maybe 1975. Well, if you want to hear about that, Rich has been talking in the pre-show for about 10 minutes, and we'll put it in the post-show <laughs> with the Easter okay. egg. <laughs> So he doesn't have to go through it again. <laughs> right, okay. Now, I, that makes sense. It will become, I got interested in translation because of polio. I think that will become obvious um, a bit later on. Let's start, though, with a bit of a review. So we have a little slide deck for everybody if you want to follow along. This will also be a video, of course. And um, we'll try and refer to these as we go. Uh, the first slide is a title slide just to set everyone up. And number two is our review, the Baltimore Scheme which we have shown before, probably in a Virology 101. It just makes the point that every virus has to get to mRNA. It has to make mRNA that can be translatable by the host cell. And we have talked about that for, uh, let's see. Yeah, we talked about transcription, so DNA templates being copied into mRNA. Did we talk about RNA-dependent RNA synthesis? I guess we did. Otherwise, Must we, we wouldn't be mm-hmm. doing translation. Yeah, I yeah. haven't done. I haven't done all of the uh, virology 101s, but I think you did that. I think we did mm. as well. So all these vi- here, there's seven classes of viral genomes. They're all shown on here, and they all have to get to mRNA in the middle, and that's and that has to be translated, which is the process we're going to talk about today: translation or protein synthesis. Which uh, I guess. One of the things that people studied really early on in the molecular biology revolution, right? Uh, figuring out the genetic code once it became clear that information went from DNA to, to RNA, right? Mm-hmm. The code was cracked in 1964, I believe. I think that was the Nuremberg and Leader paper that did uh, that basically cracked the whole thing by doing triplet binding assays with uh, labeled amino acyl tRNAs. And then, and fortunately, you could isolate ribosomes by a simple differential centrifugation. So the whole protein synthesis machinery came down in, you know, it was a very easy, easy isolation. All you do is grind up some E. coli and with a, literally with a mortar and pestle and some alumina, okay? And then uh, you add a little DNA to decrease the viscosity and stick it in the centrifuge tube and do a low speed spin 30,000 G's for 30 minutes and that gives you what they call an S30 supernatant 30 and that in fact if you add radioactive amino acids to it that will translate whatever's there but you can get more sophisticated than that you can take that stuff and spin it for I think it's 
a hundred or two hundred thousand G's for a couple of hours, and the ribosomes come down. It's this gelatinous looking pellet. Toss off the supernatant, and the ribosomes have the initiation factors attached to them. So uh, all you have to do is add messenger RNA to that, and you can get uh, protein synthesis. And then there's ways to dissociate the initiation factors and, and sort through them. But I've often thought that if it weren't for the fact that this was a, you know, a, a coherent macromolecular machine, uh, that it would have been, you know, if I mean, if we got, a, uh, what, three RNAs and 50 proteins involved. It would have taken forever to figure out protein synthesis. But it all comes out pretty easily and it makes it easy to study right all right so let's move on to slide three which is a we're going to focus on except for what rich says we're going to focus on (laughs) eukaryotic protein synthesis today and you can add color commentary uh, because this is these slides are all based on my course and uh that really focuses on eukaryotic Virology. Well, isolating eukaryotic ribosomes is basically the same process. Yeah, yeah. So here on slide three is a typical mRNA, which we've talked about, I think, before. Uh, the fact that they are capped and they have um, five and three prime non-coding regions or untranslated regions, UTRs. There's an open reading frame, which uh, usually but not always begins with an AUG, as we will see, a stop codon, and then these mRNAs are typically polyadenylated, but viruses don't always do that. They break some of the rules. And um, these these non-translated regions have various functions. And with respect to translation, the five prime UTR is really important for regulating the efficiency of translation because, as we'll see, ribosomes move through this region, and if there's a lot of secondary structure there, it can influence the, uh, the efficiency of their passage and the 3 prime N2 can regulate translation, and so can the poly-A tail. So that's our, that's our subject, that mRNA. That's what we need to translate. You were going to say something. I was just going to say that the 3 prime end, as you have noted here, is also important in messenger RNA stability. It is. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. Very interesting field. And mm-hmm. viruses muck with that, mm-hmm. which we should talk about at some point. Actually, you know, I wonder, and I've never really thought about this. We now know that microRNAs can bind to the three prime untranslated regions and affect the stability mm-hmm. of messenger RNAs. I wonder how much of what was uh, studied previously about the role of three prime ends in mRNA stability has to do with microRNAs. I know some of it does not, but yeah, yeah, it's a good point. I bet some of it does. You move the, you remove the. Um the binding sites, and you change yep. the stability, yeah. Yep. And when you talked about uh, viruses breaking the rules, uh, they break almost every rule of translation. Or there's exceptions to almost every rule that you could make other than translation happens on ribosomes and happens 5' prime to 3'. Prime. But almost every other thing, there's yeah. some exception or little tweak or something. That of course, rule is... Uh, flighty thing is things we make up right yeah sure sure we try to categorize Pat- things into rules yeah. right. patterns yeah. that we observe yeah. right to make it well, easier for us to study i guess yeah. well that's a uh, that's actually a little side benefit of being a virologist is that you uh discover that rules really are made to be broken mm-hmm. absolutely and it twists your head that way and, and if they're not you're disappointed right <laughs> always, always looking for exceptions uh, let's see, slide four. Ah, here we go. And we'll go talk a little bit about the translational machinery, just briefly, so we make sure everyone's on the same page because some of you, I'm sure some of you know all of this who are listening and others may not. Of course, you need ribosomes to make protein. And these are wonderful machines that, uh, as we'll see, move along the mRNA and help translate the code into a protein. And here we have a eukaryotic ribosome. It actually looks like a turkey, doesn't it? Uh, it does. Yes. <laughs> uh, you have said before that it looks like, I think you've said flying turkey? Yeah, we have some figures where they look like they're flying around. <laughs> I, sh- I showed it to someone recently. They said, no, more like a chicken. Okay. Uh, Either way, it's like a leg there, right? So <laughs> this episode could be subtitled <laughs> The Invasion of the Flying Turkeys could or be. something like that? It could be. 
Yeah, if Alan were here, he'd be making titles up. Anyway, eukaryotic ribosomes sediment at ADS and and uh, sucrose gradients, and they can be they they consist of two subunits, a 40s and an, and a 60s subunits, and of course these are made up of proteins and ribosomal RNAs. And not too long ago, the the structure of these huge machines were solved. Um, you probably know who did that, the Stites Lab, right? Uh, 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 yes, uh, Tom Stites did. Uh, one of the subunits, uh, and I'm I'm embarrassed to say I can't. I think it was the 50s. There was another um, laboratory that did the 30s, and another laboratory <clears throat> that pioneered a lot of the techniques uh, for doing this. And the three of those people together won the Nobel Prize for that work. Uh, the 70s structure as a you know a, an assembled structure was subsequently. Uh, uh, figured out by uh, Harry Nuller. So 70s is the prokaryotic ribosome. 70s is the prokaryotic, yeah. yes. And okay. eukaryotic it's, it's is slight, it's slightly smaller. Yeah. And I will look up that Nobel Prize while we're talking to find out exactly who did it. So the the structure on the lower right is colored for RNA, which is pink and yellow, and protein, which is blue. So you can see that um, they're sort of they're intertwined in a substantial way. But it turns out I. Th- I think maybe Noller was involved in these experiments. Uh, uh, if you take uh, take the protein away, the RNA can still catalyze peptide bond uh, formation. Yes, uh, Harry was uh, Harry was one of the first people to recognize that the RNA could catalyze, in particular, peptidyl transfer. So yeah. that that reaction itself is RNA catalyzed, I believe. Yeah. Uh, mm. So the uh, 2009 Nobel Prize in Chemistry went to. Uh, Van Katraman, Ramakrishnan, and Thomas Stites and Ada E. Yonath. She was the woman right. who pioneered a lot of the techniques. That's right. I remember that. She figured out how to get these things. She got them out of uh, some kind of extremophile, I think. Uh, it could be the thermo, uh, thermo uh, what is it? Archaea. Yeah. Don't remember. Uh, some sort of a thermophile was was the first one, I think. But she was important. Uh, my recollection is, and I could be wrong about this, that she was critical in uh, being able to get the criti- uh, crystals and also yeah, in, right. with a, uh, solving the structure of this thing because it was such a huge machine involved uh, some uh, really novel advances in X-ray crystallography itself. And I believe that she's um, responsible for some of those. Right. As were the other labs. So this was only four years ago. Yeah. Yeah. I think we must have mentioned it on Twitter. Well, the Nobel Prize was four years ago. Yeah, the, the right, right. solution structure was somewhere before then. Yeah. And if you were Rouse, it would be 50 years before. <laughs> and the fact that the RNA does the catalysis is uh, has been used in support of the RNA world hypothesis that mm-hmm. life first was in an RNA world and maybe the ribosomes evolved then. It's cool to look at this structure that you have here, and the brown is the uh, RNA, and see that a lot of the RNA is in a in a helical structure. Yeah, that's right. It's supposed to be pink, but I guess your monitor looks brown, huh? Uh, yeah, okay, pink, brown, whatever. <laughs> and then between the so that's the two subunits, is it? Yeah, I think so. You got the uh, uh, whatever it is, uh, the fifty sixty S and a forty S. I think so. And that little. Uh, what's the little blue plot? You know, it's a, it's just an enzyme for or some protein oh, for, for comparison. comparison. Yeah, I don't okay. remember which one it is. Okay. I should look at my book. Yeah. I'll, I'll do that. Yeah. <clears throat> I want to make sure it's just not the same subunit turned sideways. You know, it's chapter eleven. Oh, it's but it might be a new figure because uh, it's sorry, not, it is. It's yeah. not in the book. Yeah, I pulled it off of David Goodsell's site. I don't know if you guys know that. He's an artist out at Scripps, and uh, he's got his own website, David Goodsell. You can find wonderful structures there. All right, slide five are the tRNAs, the transfer RNAs, and three different versions. These, of course, are the adapter molecules that read the code on the mRNA, and to them is attached an amino acid that corresponds to that. And on the left is a just a... A linear molecule showing all the bases. These are short tRNAs and all the extensive base pairing and some of the unusual bases, methylated bases and dihydrouracil. And then in the middle is a um, trace, but it's a sort of a three-dimensional trace showing the anticodon. That's the part that 
reads the uh, codon and the mRNA, and then the amino acid attachment site in yellow. And then on the right are space-filling RNAs. So you can see the big difference when you display these, these RNAs differently. You get a real mm-hmm. feel for the, the way they actually look on the right. Mm-hmm. Pretty neat. So I think it's significant that the overall structure for all of the tRNAs is quite similar, which makes sense because they have to interact with a ribosome in the same fashion. Yep. And, uh, and yet, there have to be differences, first of all, obviously in the anticodon where it interacts with the messenger RNA, but there have to be differences elsewhere in the tRNA so that the enzymes called aminoacyl tRNA synthetases that put the uh, amino acids onto the three prime end can discriminate one of these tRNAs from the other. So that's, that's really um, a, a hefty task, being similar enough so they all interact with the ribosome in the same way, but different enough so that the, they can all be charged with a different amino acid. So does the, do the tRNA synthetases look at the uh, anticodon as well as other things? I do not believe so. Uh, they may in some cases, but now, now, okay. Yeah, so we're right. we're reaching back into my history here. But I think that there have been experiments done where people have mutated the anticodon, and the tRNA still gets charged correctly. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's, it's a tall order, but yeah, hey, evolution can yeah. handle mm-hmm. it. You've got a lot of time to mess around <laughs> with it. A lot of time. All right, slide six uh, is a list of all the translational machinery, uh, the ribosomes, the tRNAs, and then there are a lot of proteins involved in initiation of st- protein synthesis, and we'll talk about that a bit. The elongation phase where you add uh, amino acids to grow the polypeptide, and then the termination proteins, and these have names, and eukaryotes, they're EIFs, EEFs, and ERFs. I don't know why they call it RF instead of ETF. I think they're release factors. Yes. That's it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it, it's funny, though, because initiation, elongation, instead of termination, we should say release factors on this slide, right? Yeah. And, of course, they called them factors. And when we wrote the textbook, one of the co-authors was very adamant about this. Jane Flint, she hates the word factor, <laughs> especially if you know that it's a protein. She in our first version of the book it was full of factor, and she would yell at us. You can't. It's it's a protein or an RNA or a DNA. Call it what it is. So that's why I have proteins here instead of factors. I am to this day haunted. Wow, that. that's a pretty scary experience. Oh, all these things we went through. You know, mutation versus mutant, mm-hmm. transfection versus transformation. I mean, she. Worked on us very hard, and now it, it has infiltrated all aspects of my my being. <laughs> I like Jane very much. She did a good job mm-hmm. with us. Yeah, yes. well, you know that sort of precision is important. Release factors. Okay. All right. Slide seven. Let's go over uh, translation. Now, in general, I like to look at the initiation step as possibly happening in two two different ways. And the first way is on this slide. It's called 5 prime N dependent initiation. And here you need a cap on the mRNA because the cap helps to recruit the initiation complex. And that's, that's what's shown in this slide. And basically the problem is how do you get the ribosome to the mRNA? In this case, it's by having a cap at the 5 prime N, which interacts with this protein EIF4E and that in turn interacts with a bunch of other proteins, which ultimately bring in uh, the 40S subunit. So here we have a sequence of events. We have a 40S subunit binding some initiation proteins. And the key event here early on is the binding of what's called the ternary complex. It's the MET tRNA. That's going to be the first tRNA that sits down on the mRNA with GTP and EIF2. This is important because we're going to talk about this later when we talk about regulation. What's that little red UAC box there? That is the AUG. Uh, that's the AUG anticodon, okay. right? Okay. Oh, oh, oh that okay. tRNA okay. that's behind All right. it. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. All right. One of the other important proteins that comes into this complex, well, two of them is EIF4G. It's the red protein. It's quite big. 
and then EIF3. So EIF3 is actually binding the 4DS subunit directly. EIF3 then in turn binds EIF4G, and 4G then binds EIF4E, which binds the cap. So you can see there are a series of cap, protein, 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 ribosome interactions, and that's how this whole complex gets to the mRNA. This is really Rube Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> it works, but this is bureaucracy at work, I swear. Okay. And a lot of this was figured out in virus-infected cells because mm -hmm. it turns out that some viruses mess with this. So, for example, some viruses cleave EIF4G, and that's how that protein was discovered, and its role as a bridge was figured out. Otherwise, it's really hard to, to sort all this out. So the idea here is that this initiation complex forms, and then it somehow moves down the mRNA to reach the AUG. And, uh, and how that happens is a, is a bit of a mystery. Um, in the next slide, slide eight, it's, it's illustrated. So again, we have at the top our initiation complex, and then it, the idea is that it, the ribosome scans down until it finds the, the AUG that's going to be initiated. And here is where if you have secondary structure in the mRNA, it can impede the ribosome. So there's a little RNA stem loop at the top shown there. And the more secondary structure you have, the more uh, you have to unwind it in order for the ribosome to get by. And that unwinding is carried out by an RNA helicase called EIF4A. And that needs energy in the form of ATP hydrolysis. So that's why the ATP is shown there being hydrolyzed to ADP. And the EIF4A, it's shown there, it's the uh, vertical uh, olive green colored thing. That's right. It's exactly olive green as I envisioned it, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, not necessarily absolutely. I mean, I think this thing in, uh, does AUGs in sequence. I mean, it, it, the first AUG is quite often the preferred AUG. It's scanning until it encounters one. But the sequence content, sequence yeah. context is important, too. It can skip over some yeah, to right. find a better one. So it's not absolute. Absolutely, yes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's not absolute. Absolutely not absolute. <laughs> yeah, the sequence context is very important, yeah. When the AUG is reached, which happens in the middle of this slide, um, then... The big subunit, the 60S subunit, comes in, and that's associated with a lot of these factors, these uh, initiation factors coming off, um, and also um, release of the GDP, which was previously hydrolyzed uh, during the scanning stage. So now you have at the bottom uh, an, an RNA with a full ribosome and tRNA met in the site ready to initiate protein synthesis. So that's five prime independent, and I think it's obvious why it's called that because you need to have that five prime cap. So, uh, just as an aside, in prokaryotes, it is not five prime independent, right. and the ribosomes can pick an, uh, the appropriate AUG out of the middle of a sequence. And what is appropriate is determined by sequence upstream that base pairs with the ribosomal RNA associated with the small subunit. And uh, this has uh, implications for uh, how messenger RNAs, what the structure of messenger RNAs is, how they're used that we'll get to later on. Yeah, absolutely. All right, the next slide is nine, which... Uh, makes the point that it, there is good evidence that uh, mRNAs actually become circularized, as shown here. So this is an mRNA bound to the initiation complex with just the 40S subunit. But it's believed, and there's, again, good evidence for this, that the three prime end of the mRNA has to come loop back and bind EIF4G, as shown here. Now, the three prime end is we said earlier of mRNAs have a poly A tail and that binds a cell protein called poly A binding protein and poly A binding protein in turn binds EIF4G and it's thought that this configuration is good for efficient mRNA translation because if you disrupt it um, the mRNAs are translated less efficiently and I show this because we have a part later on that refers to this so again, in prokaryotes, you don't have a poly A tail, right? 
Uh, and so I don't know if there's any evidence for circularization in that case or not, but certainly it's going to be different. Mm. And there are some <clears throat> prokaryotic RNAs, messenger RNAs, that have poly-A tails. Mm. That's okay. uh, Sidney Kushner's work so, right. and, and others, but um, it has to do with mRNA stability. Not involved so. in translation at all? Can't be sure about that. Yeah, because if, uh, yeah, yeah. if the RNA is unstable, you never know. Right? All right, next slide 10. So then the other way of initiating translation, so we have 5' independent, and we have internal initiation. And this was discovered first in uh, poliovirus and encephalomyocarditis virus, two picornaviruses. And so when the polio genome was sequenced, which is shown at the top here, it was found that there was a very long 5' untranslated region uh, of about 700, in this case, 742 bases, and then you have that first methionine codon, which begins the protein translation. So if everyone remembers, the RNA of poliovirus is a 7.5 kilobase plus stranded RNA, has this long uh, 5 prime untranslated region, and then a very long open reading frame that covers most of the mRNA, and the way this genome is translated is into a long polyprotein, which is then processed by proteinases. So when the sequence of this was determined, it was found that there's this very long untranslated region, which was full of AUG codons, and it wasn't really understood how um, that could be translated by scanning ribosomes. In addition, there was no cap on this mRNA. Uh, the, the genome in the, in the virion has a small protein on it called VPG. And as we discussed some time ago on TWIV, there's an enzyme in the cell that cuts that off and the belief is that it's cut off before translation occurs. So the RNA, that the mRNA actually has just a phosphate on the 5' end. So it was really unconventional. And so two laboratories, uh, Nahum Sonnenberg and Eckhard Wimmer, had the idea that maybe the ribosomes don't bind the 5' end of these RNAs. Maybe they go internally, internal initiation. So I want to show you two experiments that uh, were used. Before you that. do that, yeah, um, I just want to point out that the sequence at the top is the is the DNA sequence, yep. and so where you're talking about an AUG, here it's actually indicated as an ATG. And as mm -hmm. molecular biologists, we go back and forth pretty easily. But those of you who don't think about it, um, RNAs have a U, DNAs have a T, um, they and those are what base pair with A. Yeah. So the reason why that's DNA is because that is uh, this is actually the sequence I did as a postdoc of a DNA copy of poliovirus RNA. Mm -hmm. And so we sequenced the DNA, so we put the DNA sequence up. Um, I don't know if we even thought about it. I think this, the programs at the time would only take <laughs> <laughs> DNA, I remember. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. All right, slide 11. Uh, this was um, one of the neat experiments done to show that ribosomes could bind internally in this five prime end sequence of poliovirus RNA. So here we have uh, two different kinds of synthetic mRNAs that were constructed. So on the top left, we have an mRNA. This is a capped polyadenylated mRNA. It's called a bisistronic RNA because it has two open reading frames in it. And when I, when I teach this to my students, I say, you can tell how old these experiments are because they use TK and CAT as, as readouts for translation. And they had to measure protein synthesis by, you know, a Western blot or a, or a gel. Whereas nowadays we would use luciferases to do this right. very easily. Uh, <laughs> and and cistron is another way of talking about an open reading frame. Right. right. That's another molecular biology term. So, so by cistronic. Yeah, Go ahead. Two, two, two open reading frames, yeah. So on the left is two open reading frames on that mRNA with uh, just a green, a light green spacer sequence in the middle. And then on the right... The same two open reading frames, two TK and CAT, but in the middle they put the five prime non coding region of poliovirus in there. All right, it's labeled IRES, and that'll, well, obviously you can see it on the slide <laughs> because it's an internal ribosome entry site, but of course they didn't know that when they did the experiment. Now, if you translate these mRNAs, what you find is the mRNA in the left with just a spacer sequence, you make a lot of the TK protein, but not much of the, the CAT because ribosomes in eukaryotic cells don't like to translate two 
uh, open reading frames in tandem. They'll, they'll do the first, and then most of the ribosomes fall off, and a few may get through to the second uh, and make a little of that protein. But if you put the polio 5' prime non-coding region into this mRNA, then you make a lot of both proteins. The suggestion being that ribosomes can bind internally at the CAT uh, AUG codon. Now, on the bottom, the same experiment was done except in poliovirus-infected cells. And this is a really nice control because in polio-infected cells, 5' mm. prime N-dependent initiation is inhibited. So ribosomes can't bind at the 5' prime cap. And so you see you get no, on the left construct, you get nothing synthesized because ribosomes can't bind the 5' prime cap. So you don't get TK protein, you don't get CAT. But on the right-hand mRNA with the 5' prime UTR of polio, you can get the CAT protein made, which says that, or suggests that the ribosomes can bind at that CAT AUG. Very cool. It's a cool experiment. And yeah, very cool. So as a result, uh, it was called the internal ribosome entry site. And actually, uh, Wimmer's group called it an iris, and not, Sonnenberg called it a ribosome landing pad, RLP. Mm -hmm. And the field decided that iris was cooler. <laughs> I, I like it too. However, there were skeptics, and there continue to be skeptics to this day, who said, well, you know, you could interpret this to mean that the iris just causes the uh, the RNA to fragment, and um, that's why you get initiation at the cat gene. So many years later, actually, this the next experiment on slide 12 was done by Peter Sarno. And what he did was to make circles, RNA circles. And um, the idea here is that 5 prime N dependent initiation, you need a free 5 prime N. So if you make a circle shouldn't be able to translate by a 5 prime N dependent mechanism, but an iris dependent mechanism doesn't need a 5 prime N. So he made two circles, which contained an open reading frame, an AUG with a termination codon that would encode a protein, and one of the circles has an iris and the other does not. And as you would predict, the circle with the iris can be translated to protein, the one without an iris cannot. Cool. I think this is a cool experiment. Mm-hmm. So it kind of really proves, I think, that the iris allows ribosomes to bind internally. So these were first picked up on uh, viral RNAs, and many different viruses, it turns out, have these kinds of internal ribosome uh, entry sites, both DNA and RNA viruses. And slide 13 just shows a few of them. These have been categorized into types, uh, type 1, 2, 3, and 4 irises, and they, you can see they all have a lot of secondary structure, and the sequences of these are all very different. In fact, uh, it's very hard to to look at sequences and say this is an iris because it's actually the structure that is really important for internal ribosome binding. So if you have a sequence which you think might be an iris, you actually have to make a bisistronic mRNA and actually test it functionally. You can't just look at the sequence. So we we think that there, for example, are, hum are irises in the human genome, but we don't know how many because you can't just tell by looking at the sequences. What does these uh, boxes with the PY indicate? So these are uh, irises from four different uh, RNA viruses, and the PY is a pyrimidine-rich sequence, which happens to be in some of the irises and is important for... Um, iris activity for internal ribosome binding. Okay. Type 1 iris is polio and rhino. Type 2 is um, uh, encephalomyocarditis type irises. Type 3 is the hepatitis A virus iris. And type 4 is the hep C iris. Mm -hmm. All right. Slide 14. So this is a summary of the two different initiation mechanisms at the top 5 prime independent. In the middle, the iris, which shows how we think the, the ribosome is brought to the mRNA. So remember, the cap-dependent or 5 prime independent the cap brings the ribosome to the iris. But for, for the irises, we think that um, in some cases, the initiation proteins actually recruit the 4DS subunit to the mRNA. So in the middle, the type 1 and 2 iris, it's thought that EIF4G, the red protein, actually binds directly to the iris sequence. 
and then that, of course, recruits the 40S subunit in. So is that uh, on the EIF4G, is that squiggly line the protease cleavage site for the picornaviruses? Yes, exactly. So 4G is cleaved by uh, in, in picornavirus-infected cells. And in fact, that cleavage inhibits or shuts off cap-dependent translation, you can say. Right. So it wouldn't be able to bind the cap anymore. But the, the that end is not needed for iris-dependent translation. Okay. So it's a brilliant strategy, right? Right. You shut down the host, and you can still translate your own mRNA. So it shifts the emphasis from host translation to viral translation yeah. in one fell swoop. Evolution is gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> now, go ahead, Kathy. I was just going to say, an adenovirus translational control mechanism also involves the EIF4G because the L400K protein binds to that EIF4G and displaces a particular kinase that isn't shown in this. Um, and that results in uh, dephosphorylation of EIF4E and uh, relates to, again, being able to shift the translation toward the virus and away from the cell. Wow. Right. Yes. Yeah, so phosphorylation of 4E is believed to be important for cap binding, right? Mm hmm. And at the bottom in this slide is hepatitis C virus iris, which is really interesting because this iris does will bind the 40S subunit directly. does not need any other initiation proteins. Hmm. So it's Weird. thought to be maybe a very ancient, maybe this is a, you know, something from the RNA world or near to it that didn't need any other protein, just the 40S subunit. So, so the other irises do need some initiation proteins, and they vary as to what they need, but um, Hep C iris doesn't need any. So there are lots of viral irises now known, as well as cellular irises, and some of those are shown in slide 15. These are some of the viral irises on the left. Um, there are also some DNA viruses with uh, irises not shown here. And on the right, we also know there are irises in cellular genes. We know this because for these examples shown here, people have done the functional assay. They've made bisestronic uh, mRNAs and um, shown that they can lead to internal initiation. So they weren't known in the genome until they were picked up in a virus. So I think that's pretty cool. What they're doing in the cell genome is not understood. And in fact, this is a pretty controversial field. There are some people who believe that these, these actually never function as... Um, as irises in the cell, but that's that's a topic for another twib. So, if that's the case, then how do you explain them getting translated? So they're all present at the five prime end of mRNAs. None of uh, them, none of them are internal, mm -hmm. like um, you know, like in a bisestronic okay. uh, configuration. So these are all in mRNAs that are capped, you know, and. The five prime end happens to have an iris in it, so it's just not clear uh, what what the function would be of that. Okay, of but there are, there are a few eukaryotic messenger RNAs that are polycystronic. Um, your textbook mentions one, and then I went in search of what that one is, and there are evidently some additional ones since then. Do they have irises in in between that, them? I don't. No, yeah, because the one I, that's in the book um, is the it doesn't have factor an iris. one in the nervous system, the yeah. GDF. Yeah, I'm not sure it has an iris in between. So I don't know how that would be translated. There may be right. some other could be read through or some other mechanism. Yeah, All right. So it's really weird. Still, I don't know what's going mm -hmm. on. Um, okay, so let's go to slide 16. So now we've we've initiated and we're back to where we we start. We we can get. We have a met tRNA in the P side of the ribosome bound to the mRNA. So either 5 prime end dependent or internal initiation, they both get you to this point. And one of the things that will become evident is that the met tRNA is special because it can go directly into the P site. That's right. The, P site, the, the ribosome has three sites, E for, for exit, P for peptidyl, and A for amino acid. And the A is where the next... Uh, tRNA would go in, and then a peptide bond would be formed between the amino acids, and then the ribosome would move down one triplet, and then that would put the, in this case, the met tRNA in the E or the exit site, and it would leave, leave the tRNA. So exit refers to what the tRNA is going to do. That's right. 
slide 17 uh, shows that you can, in some cases, initiate translation without, without a methionine. So for years, we have thought that only methionine initiates uh, protein synthesis, and the MET-tRNA is the, is the uh, initiator, tRNA. But here are two examples of um, uh, RNAs from RNA viruses where you get methionine-independent initiation. The top one is from a picornavirus called cricket paralysis virus. And here, the RNA folds to mimic a tRNA, and the ribosome thinks that's the initiator tRNA. Weird. So <laughs> you don't actually put in a methionine. The, next, the first amino acid of the protein would be the second codon. In this case, it's an alanine, an A. So you would miss these genes because if you just look for open right. reading frames with a methionine, you're not going to see these. So, you know, in the, in the human genome or whatever genome you look at, you might be underestimating the number of genes. Well, in fact, that reminds me that in this ribosome profiling stuff that's being done now, which is sort of a, a global sort of high throughput deep sequencing way of looking at uh, uh, ribosomal initiation on messenger RNAs, they are uncovering all sorts of initiation sites that uh, they had missed before. And I think a lot of them don't have methionine. So it could be that this goes on a lot. Hmm. Once again, viruses lead the way. Yeah. The bottom is another cool one. This is a plant RNA virus where the three prime end folds just like a tRNA and it mimics the initiator also. It sits in the uh, P site of the ribosome and the ribosome says, yeah, there's an initiator tRNA there and then it begins its protein synthesis. Okay, I was not aware of that. I knew that there were three prime, I knew that there were tRNA like structures in the ends of some uh, messages, but I didn't know what they were for. Look at that. I'll be darned. Yeah, that's what they do. All right. Um, so, all right, slide 18. So this is the issue that Rich was referring to earlier. In general, with, with some exceptions, on the top is our eukaryotic mRNA. They're typically monocystronic. They have one open reading frame. There are now some exceptions, as Kathy mentioned, but very rare. But bacterial and archaeal uh, mRNAs are poly can be polycystronic. They can have multiple open reading frames on the same message. And as Rich said, you can do that because there's a sequence around each AUG that recruits the ribosome. It's the shine del Garno sequence, right? Right. And these things don't have caps. They don't have poly, poly A tails. So the, you know, the mechanisms, there's, there's similarities. And there's you know, a whole gaggle of factors involved. But uh, there are some significant differences as well that lead to this. And that has implications for regulation because it means that you can turn on a whole bank of genes uh, simultaneously by directing transcription through that whole polycystronic unit. Right. Now, this has implications for eukaryotic viruses because many of them um, have a single genome, let's say a piece of RNA, but they want to make more than one protein. So how do you do that? And so viruses have evolved a variety of ways to do that. And I just want to mention a couple of them. And they are summarized in the next slide, number 19. It's called decoding the viral genome. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different ways that um, viral genomes can make more than one protein. You can make a polyprotein, for example, like the coronaviruses do. You can make a bunch of mRNAs from the single genome, subgenomic mRNAs. You can have a segmented genome like influenza virus. You can do internal initiation and then a bunch of others, leaky scanning, reinitiation, suppression, and frame shifting. So we're going to talk about uh, some of these just to give you a sense. So I look at these as ways that viruses get around this, uh, this limitation of monocystronic uh, mRNAs in eukaryotic cells. Do you make anything of the fact that except for the herpes viruses that you have listed here, there are all RNA viruses? Hey, I think basically um, the DNA viruses just make a lot of mRNAs, right, that can encode one protein or one or two proteins. Whereas I think the RNA viruses are limited, um, especially if you're a plus strand RNA mm -hmm. virus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're limited in, in 
in how many mRNAs you can make. That's the observation anyway. You know, it's, it's mm-hmm. kind of strange because there are some plus strand RNA viruses like the flaviviruses that do make a subgenomic mRNA, but they only make one. Mm-hmm. And you you could imagine that it might have evolved. They could make eight subgenomic, right. right, and make eight proteins, but it doesn't work. It doesn't mm-hmm. happen. I wonder if this doesn't also have something to do with the fact that most DNA viruses have evolved in the nucleus, where they have to deal with all that stuff as well. Whereas the RNA viruses, for the most part, have evolved in the cytoplasm. Maybe, maybe that's part of it. It's an interesting problem. I never thought of that before, but that's cool. All right, let's look at some of these. Slide 20 is just polyprotein synthesis, which uh, we have talked about here and in other TWIVs. Um, the top is a example of the coronaviruses, and the bottom's the, the flaviviruses. These are both viruses with plus-stranded RNA genomes. They have a single long open reading frame. So how do you get more than one protein out of that? Well, one easy way is to make a long protein and chop it up with proteases. So that's what the Picornas and the Flavies do. The Picornas use virus-encoded proteinases to do that. The Flavies use a mixture of virus and cell proteases to do it. It's the same idea. Polyproteins. Do you know who discovered polyproteins in viruses? Uh, is that Eki? No, it was before him. Who? Oh. Um... <laughs> I forgot his name. <laughs> Ellie Ehrenfeld's husband. Don Summers. Don Summers. Don Summers, well, he was at Einstein. Huh. Cool. Yeah. And he did protein gels, and he said there's a polyprotein. And yeah. then when the sequence was done, it was, there it was. All right, the next slide, 21, is leaky scanning. This is another way you can get more than one protein from an mRNA. And this is from a paramyxovirus, a virus with a negative strand RNA genome. And I love this one. The paper where this was originally published was called something like Translational Gymnastics. <laughs> because this, this is just one of the uh, six or so mRNAs produced by this uh, paramyxovirus, but it encodes, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five six, seven, eight different proteins. Mm-hmm. And part of the way this is done is by leaky scanning that you kind of referred to before, Rich. So if you look at the bottom green line, there's a five prime cap. The ribosomes load onto the cap. They start to scan. And the first translation initiator they reach is ACG81. And some of the ribosomes make start to translate. They make this C prime protein of 215 amino acids. But that's not a very that's not an AUG codon, and, and most of the ribosomes don't initiate there. They keep moving down, and the next codon they reach is AUG 104, and they make this P protein, the brown one, which is in a different open reading frame. But AUG 104 is not in a good context; it doesn't have the right surrounding sequence. So a lot of ribosomes keep going, and they reach AUG 114, which is a good context, and then so they make the rest of the ribosomes. Initiate that. So three different proteins right there just by what we call leaky scanning. And uh, do I understand correctly that the brown guy is in a different reading frame than the blue guys? That's right. Okay. Totally different proteins. So you can get two proteins out of basically the same sequence. Well, more than two because you got several different versions of the blue guy. Apparently these extra or different end terminal amino acids make a difference. Uh-huh. Then you have these other two, Y1 and Y2, which are initiated way down. And this is by a process that we didn't talk about. It's called ribosome shunting. The ribosomes, shortly after they load on the 5 prime end, they actually leap over all this sequence and end up at 183 or 201. And uh, that involves them moving along secondary structure. So we've got wow. two more proteins. Uh, then if you move up to the green line at the top, you can see there's another dark blue and a brown and a W, V, and X proteins. And I know that V and W are made by editing. So a fraction of the transcripts, there's an extra base added at this editing site. It's a post-transcriptional edition. And that, that gives you this, uh, so the brown protein then, terminates to form either the V or the W protein as a consequence of that. And I don't know how X is made way down there at the end of the uh, mRNA. 
I'm not sure I want to know. That's pretty scary. The whole thing is pretty scary. <laughs> Isn't this amazing? <laughs> I just think it's pretty cool. So all these proteins from one mRNA, viruses rule. Mm-hmm. So cool. <laughs> Slide 22, and another way to do this by is by reinitiation, which is a cool process. Um, on the top, uh, the green line at the top is an mRNA from a herpes virus, CMV, where there are small uh, open reading frames in what was thought to be the five prime non-translated region. The main open reading frame on that message is blue. It's labeled downstream ORF. And apparently these little open reading frames get translated, and the ribosomes uh, keep moving, and they reinitiate at the downstream ORF. And in fact, um, this has now been found in uh, Kaposi's sarcoma-associated herpes virus. And on the recent TWIM from Berkeley, we talked a little bit about Britt Glounsinger's work to study um, how those uh, reinitiate. Mm-hmm. That was a TWIV, not a TWIM. Did I say TWIM? Mm-hmm. I'm confused. Sorry. Yeah, that sorry. was a TWIV. You're, you're, you're forgiven, Vincent. <laughs> you have a good reason. I'm 60 years old, right? That's not the reason. You're busy. <laughs> no, it's okay. I'm just too many twees on the mind. Uh, the, the bottom one is influenza virus. One of the segments of uh, influenza virus makes an mRNA that encodes two proteins, M1 and, and uh, BM2. And what's cool here is that if you look at the sequence that's put there, you see U-A-A-U-G. So the A-U-G is the initiation codon for the BM2 ORF. And the UAA is the termination codon for the M1 ORF. So the ribosome terminates and immediately begins to uh, translate the second ORF. So you get two proteins. That's cool, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah I'm a little examples. confused because the figure looks like there's more overlap than that. Am I not understanding this? Yeah. Every time I, I give this slide, someone asks that. And it's confusing because the ORF actually is bigger than the actual translated protein. So, you know, ah, an open reading frame okay. isn't necessarily defined I by an see. AUG, oh, right? Okay, I should actually remove that upstream. But then it wouldn't I be see. correct. It wouldn't be the ORF, you know? Right, okay. The AUG is actually um, where the end of the M1 ORF is. You know? Okay. Got to fix that in the next edition. All right, that brings us to suppression of termination, slide 23. And here's another way to make more than one protein. So what we're showing here is the termination event in protein synthesis. So at the top left, we have a ribosome with a tRNA in the E site about to be ejected, and there's a tRNA in the P site with a growing uh, polypeptide chain. And then if the next codon were a tRNA, another amino acid would be added, but in this case, it's a UAA. It's one of the three stop codons that you find and uh, that is recognized not by a tRNA, but typically by a termination factor complex, ERF1 plus ERF3. And these these uh, termination proteins, by the way, structurally look like a tRNA, but they recognize the stop codons. And they sit in there and they cause the uh, polypeptide to be released. But sometimes these stop codons are recognized by bona fide charged tRNAs. So they could be misread, and you stick in a, a, a normal tRNA. But there's some tRNAs that recognize the stop codons and put in rare uh, amino acids like selenocysteine. So at a low frequency, you can get suppression. It, suppression of termination, so translation continues. So you could see you can make a longer protein. And this has been found in some viral uh, mRNAs. On slide 24, um, this is an example from... Retroviruses on the left, some of the simple retrovirus genomes encode just a GAG and a Paul protein, and they are separated by a termination codon. You can see that's the UAG in the sequence. Mm -hmm. In these cases, you have to make polymerase, though. It's reverse transcriptase. So what happens about 5 to 10% of the time, that terminator is suppressed, and you get translation of the entire GAG Paul open reading frame. And there's this unusual structure diagrammed here. This is called a pseudonaut. And this is thought to be important to make the ribosomes pause uh, so that the suppression is uh, more effective. And that's not, you know, one of the things that interests me about this is that it seems like a, a silly way to make the polymerase as a fusion. 
but if I understand it correctly, that's actually important because the gag is a capsid protein. So you build the capsid, uh, and some of those uh, capsid molecules have polymerase attached to them. So that gets the polymerase in the capsid. Have I got that right? Yeah, that's right. Pulls into the capsid. And then it's cleaved after the thing buds off the cell. Crazy. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And you don't need much polymerase, right? Mm -hmm. So this is 5 to 10% of the Mm -hmm. time that happens. It makes sense. In fact, if you mess with that, if you make it happen all the time, if you m- change the UAG so now it's some other amino acid, mm-hmm. virus doesn't like that. Mm. Doesn't like to make a lot of pol. On the right is is, is uh, Synbis, an alpha virus, which is a plus stranded RNA virus, has a long open reading frame, which goes up to a termination codon, uh, which is that little bluish purplish box. And uh, so you initially get translation of just that non-structural open reading frame, but again, 5 to 10% of the time you get suppression at that terminator, and then you extend the, the protein. And what's made is then um, uh, NSP4, which is the RNA polymerase. Again, another enzyme. You don't need a lot of it. So suppression supplies all the needs. It's pretty cool, right? Mm-hmm. So do DNA viruses do this sort of thing? Do we know? How about pox? Uh, I can't think of any examples in pox. The only thing I can think of in pox is, you know, goes back a bit. That I have been suspicious for a long time that pox makes um, polycystronic messenger RNAs. There are a couple of that I characterize that where I can find, a, where there's a couple of genes in tandem and I can find a transcription initiation site upstream from one of them, but not the downstream one, Okay. And, you know, that's a negative result, so yeah, you don't know right. if it's really right. I had a rotation student at one point see if they could demonstrate by the experiments that you described that there was an iris in between those two, but that uh, we didn't get to the end of those experiments. Uh, with respect to something like this, I know of nothing like this. Doesn't mean it's not there, but yeah. how about, uh, Kathy, how about Adno or other guys, do you know? Mm, not, not thinking of any. Yeah, I think these happen in cells too. Um, Mm -hmm. There are examples of this as well. So this is not a virus, as you might guess. It's not a virus-specific mechanism. So I have this really Mm -hmm. weird uh, uh, frame of mind about this with respect to the retroviruses, because for me, translation, read-through, suppression of termination—that's a mistake. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and and the virus is relying on making this mistake ten percent of the time for things to work right. Okay. It's a mm-hmm. it's a perverse uh, uh, look at it, but it is weird, weird. isn't it? But it, yeah. I mean, in evolution, anything that works is is kept, yeah. right. So I guess right. it works. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's good enough. All right. Uh, I think we have one more of these. Yeah, ribosomal frame shifting in slide twenty five, and this is a pretty cool thing that's used again in a lot of uh, mRNAs and it turns out this is also done in E. coli. There are entire meetings devoted to uh, ribosomal frame shifting. At the top is another retrovirus RNA. Remember gag and pole in the previous example were separated by terminator. Same thing here except that this these two open reading frames are fused by ribosomal frame shifting. In other words the ribosomes translate the gag protein on the top uh, and then they back up one base and restart in a new reading frame, and they make the Paul protein. Ah, oh, it's just crazy. <laughs> Isn't this cool? So the Gag and Paul are in two different reading frames, which differ by minus one. And uh, the ribosome just backs up. And so you, some most of the time, again, 80, 90% of the time, you get the Gag protein. But not, 10% of the time or so, you get the ribosomal frame shifting, which makes a fusion protein shown at the bottom. It's interesting that uh, the end effect is the same, mm-hmm. you know, getting the fusion a certain percentage of the time, but mechanistically, although it involves translation in, in each case, mechanistically it's done differently in different retroviruses. Yeah, same end. You're absolutely Fascinating. right. Fascinating. Absolutely right. Okay, and, and then if you can't figure out this minus one business, how this would work, slide 26 is a model. Is uh, what happens. So at the top, we have a ribosome moving along an mRNA. And this, this ribosomal shifting only happens at specific sequences. They're called slippery sequences. 
And you, you'll, you'll figure out why when we go through this. So you see the top, there are two tRNAs, and the, they're binding to uh, two codons, AAU and UUA. Okay, so then we move to the next image. We have slippage of the tRNAs. They're going back one. The whole ribosome is moving back one. So now you can see these tRNAs are still pretty reasonably base paired with the, the target sequence. They're not aligned with the same codons anymore. But if you look down the sequence, the only mismatch really is the UU at the end. But apparently this is tolerated. Uh, and then the ribosome can remain, in this case, the peptide is transferred from uh, the, the P site tRNA to the A site in the next step. And then finally, the ribosome begins translating again, but now we're in the minus one reading frame. Mm. So you can see the sequence will determine this, because if you have too many mismatches, it, this, the minus one doesn't, right. doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's called a slippery, it's a slippery sequence. All right. Back a while ago when you were talking about making all kinds of messages from, uh, or all kinds of proteins from one message, it reminded me of how exciting it was uh, when the sequence of Phi X174, the small DNA phage, came out in 1977 because there was evidence that there were proteins read in two reading frames right. off of the same genome. And right. that was really kind of the first time that people thought about that and you actually had to have the DNA sequence to see that that yeah. could work and encode those proteins. I remember that. Yeah. I was in a Phi X174 lab at the time. So, yeah. Who did the Phi X sequence? Sanger. I remember the overlapping uh. frames. People were all excited about this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, again, viruses, you know, being as economical as they can with their genomes, um, doing these kinds of things any way they can. Right. All right, the last few uh, slides have to do with regulation, which occurs in virus-infected cells, regulation of translation. And slide 27 is a table taken from a review article by Ian Moore. And you, you, you won't be able to read it, but the point is that the blue line represents the way different viruses modulate initiation of translation. That is the process that we've talked about today. And the red line is the modification or regulation of elongation, and the green line is termination. So you can see that many, many ways to, to modulate initiation. In fact, it's thought to be the main point of regulation of translation, and many fewer uh, at elongation and termination steps. You put this figure in at pretty high resolution because you can zoom in on it and read the oh, yeah. fine details. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's good. Um, so I would I, w I picked one of these uh, mechanisms here to sort of talk about so you get an idea from about what we're talking about here and that starts on slide 28, which is brings us back to uh, initiation five prime end or internal initiation where we have the ribosome and this ternary complex the met tRNA at the initiation codon in this case an AUG. Now when the 60S subunit comes in, um, GDP bound to EIF2 is released. So one of the early steps of initiation, that is actually the binding of the ternary complex, GD GTP is hydrolyzed, then later it's released uh, bound to EIF2. That has to be recycled, and the GDP has to be replaced with GTP in order for another round of uh, initiation to occur. And the recycling or the replacement of GTP it takes place on a protein called EIF2B, which is shown here in, in this uh, slide. Uh, what EIF2B does, it binds GDP EIF2, and it exchanges the GTP for the GDP molecule. So now we have a new EIF2 GTP, which can bind it, a MET tRNA and go through another round of initiation. So this is an essential part of making competent ternary complex. Uh, there are ways to regulate this process, and one of them is by phosphorylating uh, EIF2. So at the bottom left of the slide, you can see a GDP EIF2 with a phosphate on it. This is put on by any number of, of different cellular kinases. We'll talk about them in a moment. 
But the effect of putting a phosphate on the EIF2 is when the GDP EIF2 binds EIF2B, it, it can't get out. It binds very tightly, and so GTP can't be put in, but more importantly, it can't be released. EIF2 can't be released, so you end up initiating, uh, inhibiting translation initiation. So basically, phosphorylating EIF2 inhibits initiation. All right. I gotcha. I can't believe people worked all this stuff out. Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> neat. A long time ago, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, slide 29 shows three what are called EIF2 alpha kinases. These are three protein kinases in cells that can phosphorylate EIF2. Uh, the top is PKR, which we have talked about on TWIV quite a bit. Uh, and in the middle of, is another one called PERC, which is in the endoplasmic reticulum. And then finally at the bottom is a yeast, EIF2 kinase, called uh, GCN2. First identified in yeast. First identified and now is in, is in other cells. Uh, the GCN, I guess, came originally from yeast, right? Mm -hmm. The name GCN. So we're going to look at PKR and how that works, and that's in slide 30. It turns out that PKR is an interferon-induced gene. It's a so-called ISG, interferon-stimulated gene. So when viruses get infected, <laughs> when cells get infected by viruses, uh, as everyone knows, the genome or the protein is sensed, uh, interferon is made, and it's shown being made as little triangles in this uh, particular slide. And interferon is secreted. It binds to interferon receptors on cells and induces the production of ISGs. And one of those ISGs is PKR, so that we have PKR labeled on the right-hand part of the slide here. So PKR is induced. It's present at low levels. It's induced by virus infection. And as it's produced, it's actually inactive as a protein kinase. Because remember, the target of PKR is EIF2, but it has to be activated. And the next slide shows how that's done. So here are two molecules at the top of the slide, which are two molecules of inactive PKR. It can't phosphorylate anything. The way they get activated is by binding double-stranded RNA, and that's shown as this green, green, olive green, Kelly green molecule. So two molecules of PKR bind, uh, double-stranded RNA, and then they can phosphorylate each other, and now they're activated. So the PKR activation requires double-stranded RNA, which is typically found in virus-infected cells. It can be found in adenovirus-infected cells. can be found in RNA-virus-infected cells. And then the, the idea is the PKR phosphorylates CIF2-alpha and then shuts down translation, so the virus infection is stopped. This is a very powerful defense, and as a consequence, many viruses have evolved ways to overcome it. We've talked about at least one, right, in the, in the episode about the accordions, the genomic accordions. We talked mm -hmm. about the pox virus way of antagonizing this. Um, yes? So, well, I was just going to reiterate that from the cell standpoint, this is uh, it, making this cell sort of commit suicide, Right. It can no longer translate its own proteins, but most importantly, the virus won't be able to translate its proteins. Right. And so this cell does this sort of altruistically to protect the, it, the surrounding neighbor cells. Right. And, and that's why... Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say why viruses want to get around this because they don't want their own translation to be shut down. I should, I, we should mention that this is also a pathway in uninfected cells. There are ways to activate... PKR without double stranded RNA. Um, mm -hmm. And it's believed to be used to regulate um, cell growth when you have to do that, if you have to kill off cells or whatever. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's talk about a couple of ways that viruses antagonize this. Uh, slide 32 is one of the older stories, uh, and this is, has to do with adenovirus. And I think this was first sorted out by Mike Matthews. I mm -hmm. think that's correct. Is that right? Mm -hmm when he was at Cold Spring Harbor. So adenovirus infects cells. Double-stranded RNA is produced, which early in infection can activate uh, PKR. And again, the PKR two molecules combine to double-stranded RNA, and it gets activated. But ad wants to get around this, and one of the mechanisms is by making these short RNA molecules called VARNA1. And that's the, the red 
RNA shown here. VA RNA has the interesting property of being able to bind just one molecule of PKR. And in that configuration, it, PKR cannot activate itself. It needs to have two PKRs next to each other on a double-stranded RNA. So this effectively prevents further uh, phosphorylation of EIF2-alpha, and the virus protein synthesis can continue. A really cool way. So the antagonist is this little VARNA1, which I don't think encodes any proteins, right? It's just a, this is its sole function, Kathy? It's just, it's just a small RNA. Yeah. And really, uh, I think of Shanks Lab as doing some of this characterization of translation. That's right. Uh, with VARNAs as well as Mike Matthews. You're absolutely right about that, yes. All right, slide 33 is the pox, the pox virus way of getting around this. And what pox does is encode what we call pseudosubstrates, proteins that mimic EIF2-alpha. So on the left is the structure of EIF2-alpha. And serine 51, which is shown is the residue on EIF2-alpha, or is a residue, that is phosphorylated by PKR. And that's the whole part of the molecule is shaded in uh, cyan there. And POX encodes these two proteins, K3L and M156R. You can see they look very much like that portion of EIF2-alpha. And in fact, so PKR will bind to them and not see EIF2-alpha. I presume the POX... Infection produces a lot of these proteins, far more than uh, EIF2-alpha. So they basically soak all the PKR away. The K3L was one of the uh, proteins in the genomic accordion paper, right, Rich? Yes, uh, yeah. and M156R is, uh, a, I believe, a myxoma protein. So it's, an, it's another Different. pox virus's version of the same thing. Okay. Now, the, le the next slide, 34 is just a table which shows some of the different viruses and how they get around this EIF2-alpha phosphorylation. And you can see the viruses there are flu, herpes, rheovirus, uh, HIV, baculoviruses, hep C, they're all there. This, there's more than this. This is an old table. And uh, the different ways they inhibit they can target double-stranded RNA or they can target PKR or the EIF2-alpha itself. This just shows you that this is a really key inhibitory step and that viruses uh, have to get around it. It's pretty cool. Very cool. Yeah. All right. And the last slide is some really cool recent stuff which um, shows just another level of translational regulation. And this involves the formation of um, stress granules and pea bodies. So on the left, we have our active polysome, that is a circularized mRNA. There's our 4G EIF340S complex, the cap, the poly A tail, and there are a couple of ribosomes uh, translating that. Now you see why I showed you the circular RNA earlier. When translation gets inhibited in cells, for example, virus-induced stress leading to EIF2-alpha phosphorylation or cleavage of uh, EIF4G. When it, translation is inhibited by one or more of these mechanisms, these um, actively translated mRNAs become stalled. They're called stalled initiation complexes. You can see them on the right there. And they get shunted into what are called stress granules. And these are very discrete structures in the cytoplasm of cells, which contain these stalled initiation complexes, as well as a variety of uh, structural proteins like TIA1, G3BP, and HDAC6. And those all get incorporated into this complex, which you can see early in many virus-infected cells. You can see the formation of these stress granules. Viruses don't like this because these are stalled complexes. They don't translate anything. So look at this list of viruses here from rota down to HCV, all of these antagonize the formation of stress granules. And for some, we know the specific mechanism. For example, poliovirus cleaves G3BP, and that prevents, it actually reverses the formation of stress granules. The virus wants to get its mRNAs out of these stress granules, because once you get them out, you can translate them again. So this is brand new. It's just like, I don't know, five years old maybe? Mm -hmm. And people are really just 
starting to understand this, what it does in normal cells and how viruses, you know, modulate it. But it's really neat. Um, the stalled translation complexes can go to another pathway, and that is towards the formation of P-bodies, which are analogous. These are storage depots for stalled initiation complexes. They have different structural components, uh, and they also involve the decapping and uh, depolyadenylation and eventually degradation of the mRNA. And these, um, these names here, uh, DDX6 and XRN1 um, and DCP1. DCP1 is the decapping enzyme. Uh, XRN1 is an endonuclease. These are all part of the, the Peabody pathway. And again, viruses antagonize those. Polio, for example, antagonizes XRN1. It doesn't want to be degraded before being put into Peabody's. So these are two pretty cool, uh, relatively new discoveries about how translation is regulated. It's kind of a stress response in cells to virus infection, and viruses have to get around it. Otherwise, they're not going to be uh, replicated. It's a war. It mm -hmm. is a war. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's an arms race, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and that's translation. Very cool. I like that. Very nice, Vincent. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks for the commentary. Sure. Yeah. All right. Let's do some picks of the week. Is that okay with you guys? Sure. sure. What do you got, Kathy? So uh, one of my former undergrads sent me this map. Uh, it's called Vaccine Preven Preventable Outbreaks. It's sponsored by the Council on Foreign Relations, which is kind of a surprising host. And... Uh, one time it worked great, the next time it didn't work, and now today it's working again. So, And I find it's a little bit better in a different browser from my usual Safari. So in Firefox, it seems to work a little better. But you can click on various diseases, for instance, measles, mumps, etc., that are vaccine-preventable. And at first, what usually pops up is the whole uh, world and for all time. And then you can click on individual years. There's a slider bar at the top. And if you slide this black slider bar with white arrows across, you can just see what's uh, where the outbreaks of these vaccine-preventable vaccine diseases are. So, for instance, in the UK, a lot of measles, which I think we had one of the listeners write in about in particular. Um, and so I just thought it was a kind of a cool way to... Uh, it's to great. investigate that, you can click on, you know, an individual country and zoom in on that, and then uh, check out the different years and so forth. So I know? think this is outstanding. This you, is really cool. So, does the size of the dot uh, correspond to how many cases there were? E, I believe so. Plus yeah. Eight. Gosh, yeah. if you look just at measles, look at the ton, measles. Ton. Holy. Yeah. Wow. So one thing I had forgotten about this that it seems like the way that this is done or that they put this together is really by people submitting points from sort of news articles or MMWR or things like that. So it so what it lacks is a, a total historical context um, and it, it only goes back as far as I can tell to 2008 and it's only mm -hmm. going to have whatever people submitted for 2008. So uh -huh. I think yeah. as time goes on, it's going to be more mm -hmm. uh, thorough. Bias. Okay, so there is a there is a submission bias here. Correct, correct. I okay. think so. So, what they have measles, mumps, rubella, polio, and whooping cough, and then other. Mm -hmm. And 2013 so far is less, but we're only part way through the year. I see. I wonder if I'm just wondering where influenza is because that's not other because there's not enough of it, uh, or maybe it's just I don't know. There's nothing in South point. America. Right. Uh, I don't know what. Maybe there's a separate website for flu. I know that Google Flu does that, so maybe yeah. maybe they didn't want to duplicate it. But this is really cool. Mm -hmm. That's very cool. Nice. I like that. Rich, what do you have? I have a book called To Catch a Virus. This is a new book by John Boos and Marilyn August. And this is a um, history of diagnostic virology. So... Uh, nerd alert. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, but uh, I found this really cool because it's, 
first of all, it's a history of virology because it's a history of the techniques that are used to detect viruses. Um, and so, uh, so it's a different perspective on a history of virology, but it captures most of the history of virology because, you know, what we know about viruses is tied to the techniques that we use to detect them. Okay, and it's done very nicely. It's uh, uh, each chapter is about a different, like technique, like immunology or cell culture or electron microscopy or whatever. And these themselves more or less come in sequence as the things were developed. Very well written. A lot of great pictures, little uh, mini biographies. And in particular, for anyone who, well, if you don't work on viruses, it's a really nice description of all these techniques and it's a nice history of virology. If you do work on viruses, for me, it was fascinating to find out how a lot of these techniques that I've taken for granted for so long were developed. It was very interesting. Hmm. So, <clears throat> for example, negative staining in electron microscopy. That's where you take a virus preparation on a grid and you treat it with uh, something that doesn't actually stain the particles, but stains the spaces between them. Okay, hmm. so that mm -hmm. the particles really stand out against the against the background of stain. Before that was developed. Uh, it was really, electron microscopy was a highly specialized technique and were really hard to interpret. Negative staining really brought it uh, to the people and, and made it a much higher resolution technique. Do you know who developed negative staining? Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Nope. Sidney Brenner. Oh, really? Isn't wow. that amazing? I didn't know that at all. All right, and that's gonna. I'm gonna save the rest of that story for another pick because that's really good. Cool. At any rate, I recommend this book. It's nice. Have you read this, Kathy? Well, uh, Rich had it on an earlier twib, and then he replaced it with something. And so I was familiar with the title, and then uh, I saw at ASM that it was, you know, one of the recent ASM press books. So I went right to the bookstore, and just ahead of me in line, Michael Gale was buying the same book. <laughs> so uh, I have read, uh, It's there's a long sort of introduction or acknowledgments or something, I can't remember, and then I've read the first chapter, um, and I've liked it so far, so I'm looking forward to continuing to read it. Cool. It's very thoroughly done. These people know exactly what they're talking about. Oh, mm -hmm. So are they, what are they? Writers? They are diagnostic virologists themselves. Ah, cool. And they, okay. they are trainees of a woman whose name I can't remember at Yale who pretty much trained all the diagnostic virologists in the United States over a long period of time. So mm -hmm. it was sort of a tribute to her uh, is the way I in interpreted it. Yes, cool. her name is Gui Jin. That is also called Edith uh, Sung, H-S-I-U-N-G. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, my pick is well, is in uh, it's because this is graduation time of year, and yesterday I went to my son's high school graduation, and of course there were commencement speeches, and this one is a famous one by David Foster Wallace, which he gave in 2005 at Kenyon College. It's called "This Is Water." I don't know if you guys have ever. I read have not this. read this. I will. Mm -mm. I'm looking Tell forward to that. It. Tell you, me about it's it. It's not very long. It's really, it's just him. Well, he was a um, an interesting fellow, very smart man. He uh, He's no longer around, took his life. But he uh, tried to tell them what was important about, you know, their education and what they should do with the rest of their life and how it relates to that. Cool. And um, he is just great. It's a really, really thoughtful uh, commencement address, so... Just read it. It's not going to take right. you more than 15 minutes. And mm -hmm. um, if you've been to commencements and haven't had very good talks, this one will make up for it. It's okay. really good. It's actually sent to me by my colleague, Sagi, here at uh, Columbia. We have two listener picks of the week. Uh, one is from John, who writes, The invention of clickers is Eric Mazur, Harvard physics professor, who made the following amusing video about his teaching experiences and he sends a youtube video called confessions of a converted lecturer and kathy so it, don't be put off by the fact that it's an hour and 20 minutes long um there's an 18 <laughs> minute version if you click on the 
the link below the video on the YouTube page. Okay. Um, I didn't even have 18 minutes to spare yet once I saw this link up. But um, <laughs> yeah, but this is probably in relation to when you were talking to uh, Leslie Schiff in Minnesota about using clickers in your lecture. Right. That's so right. I was, we did. That's right. Thank you for reminding. I was trying to think of when we had talked about clickers, which she uses in her course, or she doesn't use. I don't remember. She does. She does. She does. She does. So I don't know if we mentioned this, but you know, it used to be you had everyone had to buy a clicker, but now there are apps, there are laptop, iPhone, iPad apps, where mm -hmm. you know you put the question up on the board and they just answer it on the app, which you've linked to, you know, in some way, and then it all gets uploaded to the website and you see instant results mm -hmm. again. So you don't need to buy a clicker anymore; you just need to buy like a ninety-nine cent app or something. So that's and the great. Phone in the first place. You have to have a phone or a laptop, but most students <laughs> right. are going to have a phone or a laptop. Sure. And so this really lowers the barrier to doing clickers, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking of using it next year. I think mm -hmm. the students really like them because you stop and you make sure they're getting it. Mm -hmm. And um, so anyway, this is. I didn't know he invented it, so check it out. Uh, we have another pick from Peter who says, "Dear Twiv team, I have a suggestion for a listener pick," and he. Sends a link to what's called FameLab. FameLab works by identifying, training, and mentoring young scientists and engineers to enable them to communicate effectively through the media, making science interesting without dumbing it down. It was started in 2005 as part of the Cheltenham Science Festival in the UK. Maybe you can get some students of virology to take part. So as far as I can tell, this is sort of a competition. It looks like they make videos and... Uh, a competition for giving the best communication in science. And um, it's not clear to me how you participate. It's one of those websites, you know, I have this this metric for a website. If I can't figure out within one minute, um, I stop looking. And it's terrible, but I think for a lot of people to get into something, you have to make it really obvious. And on the homepage, it's not really obvious how you would do this. I think it's a good idea, and uh, check it out. I don't know. Have you guys heard of this before? No, no. Mm -mm. but I'm I'm passionate about the idea that communication is everything in this business, uh, and I th any anything that can be done to uh, encourage uh, in communication skills is good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thanks for that, Peter, and that will do it for this episode of Virology 101 on TWIV. You'll be able to find this at iTunes and at twiv.tv. And if you have questions, just send them to twiv uh, at twiv.tv. We'll be happy to answer them. And um, I know a lot of people wanted us to get back on uh, Virology 101, so there you go. I think in Edmonton or uh, Seattle someone mentioned it, right, Rich? Yeah. At our lunch with the students. So there you go. Yeah. We respond, mm -hmm. and we'll try to do another one this summer maybe. What's next? Assembly? Uh, I don't know. You're the you're the guy who wrote the book. That's right? what I. That's what See, I. See, what's next. the next chapter in your book? Intracellular trafficking. Yeah, I usually combine uh, and that then, with assembly. Yeah, assembly, yeah. exit, and maturation. Yep. Yeah. All right. All right. We'll do that this summer. Uh, Rich Condit can be found at the University of Florida Gainesville. Thanks for joining us, Rich. Quite welcome. Always a good time. It's great. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Thank you, Kathy. This was fun. I enjoyed it. Thank you. And um, next week, you will be um, out. It will be yes. Rich and Alan and myself. We'll enjoy your training there. I think we will. We'll see. <laughs> this is the BSL-3 training? Yes. Excellent. Cool. Mm -hmm. Have a good time. You're not going okay. to make a movie like we did, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. I mean, my, my life started with protein synthesis. Excellent. It, it, 
what I know about protein synthesis is is forty years old. Okay, but you know, <laughs> the okay. coolest experiment ever done that actually really got me into this was uh, the first uh, binding protection slash footprint experiment that Joan Stice did with R seventeen RNA that uh, that isolated and sequenced. Um, the translation initiation sites in uh, in the R17 phage. Th- those experiments, there was something about it that just absolutely turned me on. And I didn't even know when I read them that I was going to wind up in her lab. Uh, and those are still very cool experiments. Nobody even knows she did that stuff, you know? Yeah, they think true. of her as splicing and stuff. Uh, at any rate, you know, I started off with Harry and then moved to Joan's lab. I thought I was a translation freak. Uh, but that sort of uh, petered out about midway through my, uh, well, actually by the end of my graduate work. And, um, so I kind of kept up with translation for a while, but, you know, 80 or 90% of what you've got in here is, uh, uh, well, I wouldn't say news to me, but I'm not really up on the details. <laughs> so the, the, when she did those experiments, okay, so R17 RNA has three translation initiation sites. Yeah. Uh, nobody knew how translation started. Okay, they knew that um, uh, it started with a methionine, but how do you pick the right methionine in yep. frame yeah. and at the end? So that was the question. So she radio labeled R17 RNA, bound ribosomes to it, digested away the unbound stuff, isolated it on sucrose gradients, and uh, sequenced the bound material, which at the time was quite a feat. Uh, doing RNA sequencing in particular because she had three different sites that were non-overlapping and she had to sort that out out of a mix of oligonucleotides. They had the N-terminal sequences of the proteins that were encoded by the phage. So she was able to look at the bound sequences and um, uh, see that lo and behold in the 30 nucleotide protected fragments in each case there was indeed an AUG right in the middle and downstream from that wa- uh, were the codons that were predicted by the N-terminal sequence of the proteins. That was the first demonstration in a biological sample that the code was for real. Cool. And then upstream from that they also knew the C-terminal sequences of these things. Upstream from that, geez, I get all goosebumps even thinking about this. Upstream, <laughs> I'm such a nerd. <laughs> <laughs> Upstream from that, there was a sequence that did not correspond to the uh, C-terminus of the upstream protein. So that was the first demonstration of non-coding RNA, mm-hmm. intercystronic regions. She could fold these things into hairpins with the AUG at the top. So she thought maybe there was a structural basis for the initiation, and it wasn't discovered till several years later. As a matter of fact, during the time that I was in her lab, uh, that the Shine Del Garno sequence, uh, uh, she actually looked all over for uh, sequences, but they were too subtle. And the computer pro there weren't computer pro there weren't computers. We didn't use computers, okay? <laughs> but... Jeez, what brilliant experiments. And now we've got ribosome profiling, right, where you do this on a mass scale. Yep, yep. Uh, when I discovered that, I, uh, I wrote her an email and said, you know, how, how does this feel? And she said, awesome. You know, at any rate. You know, we should point out that, that all that was possible because you could purify the phage and it had mRNA in it. Yes. Because you couldn't get any mRNA in any reasonable quantity. Right. No, mm-hmm. uh, coli. The every, everything was prokaryotic, and in coli, the uh, messenger RNA half life was like three minutes, so you couldn't get anything out. As a matter of fact, Jones Lab started. The reason I worked on T seven was that the uh, uh, T seven is a DNA bacteriophage, and for reasons that I don't think are even understood today, uh, the T seven messenger RNAs have a half-life of more like 30 minutes or something like that, or maybe even longer, so that you could actually radio-label infected cells and run a gel and, uh, and uh, find the RNAs. So you could actually work on messenger RNA encoded by phage T7. So that's why she uh, started working on T7. But you're right. You, could, you had no way to get at the messenger RNA. It didn't stick around. 
Yeah, later they found that you could, well, at least in eukaryotic systems, you could purify reticulocytes. And, of course, then they just have one mRNA in them. Right. And use that. But um, before, I think that, was, that came later after the phage. So when I was in, I was in Harry's lab when I was first introduced to this, Harry Noller. And Joan, I mean, Harry, God, this was great. Harry, there was a 1969 Cold Spring Harbor meeting was on protein synthesis because uh, that was all the rage then. And he brought back from that meeting the volume on protein synthesis, and as soon as it was possible, he ran a course that was a seminar on protein synthesis, and what we did was go through all the papers in that volume. Nice. And uh, Joan's paper was one of those. And for some reason, uh, there's just the sort of the elegance of those experiments and what they, and what they showed just, just blew me away. And uh, I, unbelievable. At any rate, and then well, hopefully, ironically, uh, I wound up in her lab. It was just, I, it was all meant to be. It was hopefully just Hopefully you, uh, you'll enjoy today's yeah. Virology 101. You ready to start? You're ready, you already <laughs> no, started. I'm done. You're done? All right, take care. All right, see. All right, let's go. Ten minutes of Rich. <laughs>